Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation Understanding a Lymphoma Diagnosis Webinar. I'm Chaz, and I will be your, the moderator for today's call. During today's call, you will hear from an expert speaker, and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during today's presentation, you can ask them at any time in the Q&A box on the webinar. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow this link to complete an evaluation of this program and gain certification of attendance. If you are listening by phone, this link will be sent to your email at the end of the webinar. And now, I am pleased to introduce Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown is the Associate Director of Patient Education at the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you, Chaz, and thank you to each of you for taking the time to join us on today's Understanding a Lymphoma Diagnosis webinar. We'd like to thank our sponsors of this webinar, Foundation Medicine and Genentech. Today, we have callers from 15 countries and 44 states across the U.S. Access to expert disease information is so important, and we are thrilled to be able to bring you this program. Before I turn the program over to Dr. Smith, I want to share information with you on the Lymphoma Research Foundation. At this time, I'd like to show you a short video that better explains the work that we do in striving to impact patients, caregivers, and healthcare professionals as we work to fight lymphoma. My name is Juliana Fuller, and I was diagnosed with follicular lymphoma in 2011. The questions that came to my mind at that time were not just about treatment and about survival, but also, you know, how does a young adult face this? And from the very first moment that I was in contact with the Lymphoma Research Foundation, I was so impressed by the professionalism and just evidence-based um, information that was given. For a lymphoma patient, whether it's newly diagnosed or relapsed, the Lymphoma Research Foundation is an invaluable tool. It's a fantastic resource, number one, for patient education, whether it's online videos, online information, access to clinical trials. Patients can also meet other patients with similar shared experiences as well. When someone contacts the LRF helpline, we provide them with information about the disease itself, including information about the most common lymphoma subtypes, and we have resources that are specific to these, including fact sheets and booklets. We also provide them with information about treatment options, as well as clinical trials, and whatever their needs might be, be it financial assistance or peer support, for example. One of the ways that we connect individuals with the larger lymphoma community is through our lymphoma support network. Uh, this is a peer support program where we match patients, survivors, and caregivers with others who have been through a similar experience. We find that there's certainly something to be said about being able to connect with someone who has walked down a similar path and who can share their own experience with that individual. I will often refer patients to the lymphoma.org website as well as their app. Both of them provides useful information for whether it's the big picture or also aspects and information for the individual patients. My involvement with the Lymphoma Research Foundation, currently as, a, as an ambassador, as an FDA patient representative, and sat on oncologic drug advisory committee panels for lymphoma treatments. It's what I owe to the team that helped cure me. It's what I owe to the lymphoma community. Even since my diagnosis, there's been so many new treatments out and even changes in um, recommendation of what frontline therapies should be. To say how LRF has impacted me, it just has been huge. I felt this relief of anxiety. The resources uh, that the Lymphoma Research Foundation provides to patients um, are really invaluable. Coming to the foundation allowed me to do what I need to do as a survivor, and that is to support the new patients that we have, to support the mission to eradicate lymphoma and serve those touched by the disease.
I really hope you'll take advantage of some of the great resources and services that LRF provides. If you have questions regarding what you saw in the video, or if you need information about relevant treatment options and supportive care resources, you can reach out to LRF through our website at lymphoma.org or by calling our helpline at 1-800-500-9976. We have a wonderful program planned for you today, and I'm honored to introduce you to Dr. Mitchell Smith. Dr. Smith is the Associate Center Director for Clinical Investigations in the Division of Hematology and Oncology and a Professor of Medicine at the George Washington Cancer Center. His research focuses on improving targeted treatments for lymphoid malignancies. He is also an active member of multiple professional organizations, including American Society of Hematology, American Society of Clinical Oncology, and more. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for speaking at our webinar today. I'll now turn the talk over to you. Well, thank you. It's really a pleasure. I always uh, enjoy doing these uh, educational uh, sessions, and I do want to echo uh, support for the LRF and all the work it, it does in patient education and research. And it is fitting, since I believe today is World Lymphoma Awareness Day, uh, to be talking about lymphoma today. Uh, in my experience, most uh, of these webinars have a quite a large mix of patients from uh, I've just been diagnosed, or I know someone who's diagnosed, to people who are expert uh, and have been at this for a long time and, and want to know all the, the details of the latest trials. So I'm going to try to spend the first half of the hour on uh, sort of a general approach, getting everyone up to speed, and then hopefully leave plenty of time for, for questions that will drive further um, discussion. So the biggest problem with lymphoma for someone who's not schooled in it is what the heck is lymphoma? You understand breast cancer starts in the breast. Lung cancer starts in the lung. Well, what the heck is lymphoma? And uh, then how do we diagnose this? And, and once you have the diagnosis, uh, what's, what's your uh, future going to look like? So this is just to show you that lymphoma is down here. It's not one of the top. But it, you're not alone if you have it. Total here, men and women, is about 70, 75,000 cases a year. And people with lymphoma live, hopefully, a very long time. So there are many people walking around with uh, lymphoma in, in various states of uh, treatment or remission, or hopefully cure. Uh, so to understand what lymphoma is, you really have to understand the lymphatic system. Lymphoma means cancer of the lymph system. Uh, usually you think of that as lymph nodes, but the lymphatic system consists of white blood cells called lymphocytes, which circulate in the body, and then they're in the blood, but they're also in the bone marrow, and they're in lymph nodes, which are throughout your body, basically wherever there's a blood vessel. The spleen is a, a big part of the lymph system, and your tonsils uh, as well. And there's lymph patches throughout almost any organ, and, and uh, often in the uh, GI tract. So this lymphatic system is throughout your body, and so if you have a lymphoma, generally it's systemic. It's uncommon to have a localized lymphoma, although it does occur. Because these cells normally circulate in the body, when they become malignant, they usually continue to circulate. So when we think about uh, where lymphocytes come from, there's a stem cell in the bone marrow. It decides to be a myeloid or a lymphoid progenitor. This is for myeloid leukemia, and we're not going to talk about that, that today. But then the lymphoid cells can become B cells most commonly, uh, T cells, or natural killer cells. And if we look at this a little closer, um, the B cell, when it matures, will become a plasma cell and make antibody. Uh, a T cell will become activated and is generally uh, what your body uses to kill uh, things like viruses, but also uh, tumors. And you'll obviously hear a lot about CAR T cells, which are engineered to kill your lymphoma. And natural killer cells I won't talk much about because lymphomas of that are quite rare. So uh, in this country, well, in any, B cell lymphomas are by far the most common. Uh, T cells are a little more common in Asia uh, for reasons that aren't entirely clear. But in this country, probably 90% of lymphomas are B cells. So I'll talk mostly about that. And when you think about a B cell, now I've talked about the stem cell, it becomes a lymphoid, and then it decides to become a B cell. This is all in the bone marrow. And then it goes out into the uh, blood as a mature B cell, meaning it has uh, the ability to make antibody, and ultimately becomes a plasma cell. And we think about uh, lymphoid malignancies occurring corresponding to these different stages. So a very early immature B cell becomes a B cell leukemia, 
a more mature cell becomes the B-cell lymphoma, and the plasma cell becomes multiple myeloma, which is another kind of lymphoid malignancy, but uh, behaves separately, so we're not going to talk about that. Waldenstrom's in here. Some people put in the myeloma group plasma cells and some in lymphoma. Uh, if some of you have Waldenstrom's, we can talk about that, but uh, again, it's sort of in this space between a, a lymphocyte and a plasma cell. And then if we look at it even more closely from the stem cell to the plasma cell, this maturation, which occurs inside a lymph node, what's called the germinal center of a lymph node, the B cell goes through various processes. So the same B cell that's in the lymph node can be activated and large and give rise to diffuse large B cell lymphoma, or small and resting and uh, give rise to a more slow-growing or indolent lymphoma like follicular lymphoma. And we know they're B cells because have on their surface um, a protein, a series of proteins. Now, CD is just our nomenclature, um, and you'll hear a lot about CDs because CD19, 20, and 22 are basically expressed on all B cells, uh, normal and abnormal. And so they have become big targets, antibodies to CD20, CAR T cells to CD19, antibodies with drugs attached to CD22. And these wipe out your normal B cells as well as the B cell lymphomas but they don't touch other uh, cells like T cells or other cells in your body. Uh, so they're used both to mark B cells and also as targets for treatment. And again, here I've talked a little bit already about B cell neoplasms going to lymphoma and plasma cell neoplasms, but CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, uh, which is the most common leukemia in this country, is made of small B cells. And if it's the cells are in the blood, we call it CLL, leukemia. But if those same cells are in a lymph node, it's called small lymphocytic lymphoma. So it just indicates the close relationship between some lymphoid leukemias and some uh, B cell lymphomas. Uh, if it's in the blood, it's a leukemia. If it's in the lymph node, it's lymphoma. And it's not two separate diseases. It's just where we find the cells. Hodgkin's is another lymphoma. It actually is a spin-off of B cells, and it's much less common, but gets a lot of uh, interest because the patients tend to be younger. And then a little bit about T cells, which we'll talk about briefly. So it's complicated. You know, you say I have lymphoma, but you could have any of these. So it's a whole series of diseases, and the person uh, in the next room with lymphoma may not be at all like what you have, but maybe a totally different lymphoma, B cell versus T cell, fast-growing, slow-growing, or Hodgkin's. All are lymphomas, but very different courses. So um, it, it's a, a bit of a, a basket term. The most common of the fast-growing or aggressive lymphomas is diffuse large B cells. So I'll spend a few minutes on that. And the most common of the slow-growing or indolent lymphomas are follicular. Uh, and then there's a series of all these others. So again, it's just to show you the the um, quite large array of lymphoma diagnoses, and you really have to get an expert in pathology to determine which one you uh, have, because they're all uh, behave and are treated somewhat differently. So uh, if you have lymphoma, it's how did you know? Well, most people actually go to the doctor because they feel a lump. It might be a lymph node in the neck or under the arm or in the groin. Usually painless, so if you have an infection, the nodes are usually enlarged, but tender and painful, and then they go away when you treat the infection. These grow. They don't, uh, they don't usually cause pain. We always ask about B symptoms, but they're not that common. B, because in Hodgkin's disease, B symptoms confer a, a slightly less good prognosis, but are fevers for no good reason. Drenching night sweats. Not like I'm a little damp because it was 95 degrees out last night, but you got to get up and change your sheets or your, uh, your pajamas and unexplained weight loss of greater than 10% of your body weight. Other things which are clearly from the lymphoma but don't classify as B symptoms are fatigue, which is the most uh, difficult one to assess, and then uh, generalized skin itching. Uh, we're all, you know, if you're working, if you're, you know, home, whatever, you're busy, you're not getting enough sleep, you're tired, but the symptoms of lymphoma are really a significant difference in your level of fatigue where you know, I can't even go to work for more than an hour. I have to go home. That's not just I'm tired at the end of the day. So how do we make a diagnosis uh, if you have an enlarged lymph node? The key is to get a biopsy. There really is no substitute for that. I'm going to spend a few minutes on that. 
uh, because that's the key to m make sure you have lymphoma and not some other cause. And if you do have lymphoma, what subtype? Once we know you have lymphoma, we go about you know finding out uh, other health problems you may have. Do you have these symptoms? Uh, we would examine you all the lymph node bearing areas. We could see if we could feel your liver and spleen being enlarged. This is the tonsils and adenoids called Waldeyer's ring in the back of the throat. A series of blood tests. Bone marrow aspiration and biopsy used to be almost universal, but as we get better at this and understanding the disease and PET scans came along, uh, we probably do many fewer bone marrow tests than we did in the past. And the only way to look inside at the lymph nodes and the liver and spleen is really either a CAT scan or a PET scan. Most people today would get a PET scan it tells us not only the size of a lymph node, but also how active it is. And it might point us to the best one to biopsy. The most active one is probably the one, if it's accessible, that we want to biopsy. So it gives us a point to biopsy if we're still deciding which one. And it also tells us where you are, uh, where the disease is in your body. Uh, if you're going to get drugs which affect the heart, like a drug called adriamycin, which is a common in the fast-growing lymphomas, we want to check at your heart. Uh, we want to see if you're pregnant, if you're a woman of childbearing age. Occasionally, we do a spinal tap. Some lymphomas have a tendency to hide out in, in the spinal fluid or in the brain. And hepatitis exposure, because most people with B-cell lymphoma get rituximab, and that has been uh, linked to uh, uh, reactivation of previously hepat uh, known hepatitis. We want to check on that. But, so it's blood tests, an imaging scan, maybe a heart test, uh, and maybe a bone marrow. So there's not a lot. You don't need a lot of fancy tests for most people with lymphoma. That can be done pretty quickly in most places. When we do a biopsy, we really want to get a, preferably an entire lymph node because it's, uh, the, the pattern of growth is a very important to determine what the lymph node, uh, what, the, what type of lymphoma you have. So, this is called a fine needle aspirin, which a lot of people like to do. It's simple. You can do it in the office. You put a small needle in. You suck out some cells. Uh, but it's really not a good way to diagnose lymphoma. It might rule out other things. But uh, I'll show you a slide in a minute. At least a core biopsy where we actually get like, you know, if you imagine someone drilling for in rocks or ice and they come up with a core. Um, but it would be best if we actually get the entire lymph node. But if it's deep inside you, it may not be possible. And then we may get the core biopsy. And the bone marrow, as I said, um, uh, useful in certain patients, but not everyone. So if you think of this as a piece of a lymph node, uh, the pathologist will look at this under the microscope. This is considered a low power view and can see germinal centers or follicles and blood vessels and look at the pattern. If you were, this would be a core needle in the yellow dotted, and you could easily get a very different result if you needle happened to be here or happened to be here. So the danger of a core needle biopsy is it will give you incomplete information. You might have a small area that's normal or a low-grade lymphoma but miss the fast-growing lymphoma. So that's why it's very important not to just look at the needle but to look at the, uh, the bigger piece if possible. Uh, I can see this is not a great slide to see, but this shows, uh, this is Hodgkin's lymphoma in this column, uh, mediastinal B-cell lymphoma in this one, uh, these two, and this is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And you don't need, I'm not going to teach you to be pathologist, but uh, this is the, the usual stain, and uh, uh, they all look relatively similar. There's a little more of this pink stuff, which is, in between the cells in the mediastinal lymphoma. This is the B-cell marker, and you can see that diffuse large B-cell lymphoma uh, is very strong because it's B-cell. The mediastinal lymphoma also is strong, and these other areas are the, the sclerotic areas. But Hodgkin's lymphoma, only rare B-cells, for instance. And then this is something called CD30, which is another marker which is usually present on Hodgkin's and not usually present on large cells. So you could go through a series of these stains for various proteins that are on the cells, and that's how the pathologist determines, besides what it looks like, uh, you know, is it a B or a T cell, uh, what kind of B cell lymphoma it is, and things like that. So when people call CD something, it's really staining for various proteins, 
which have different levels of expression and different subtypes of lymphoma. So you look at, you, you get the biopsy, the pathologist processes it, they look at it uh, under the microscope for what the cells look like as well as what's expressed on their surface. Uh, this is an example of a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, just to point out that there's two main types. One's called germinal center, and one's called activated B-cell. Again, I don't expect you to even be able to see or, or read all of this, but it just shows you, again, that certain stains are very positive in the germinal type and not in the activated B-cell, and others are positive in the activated B-cell, not in the germinal center type. And these have prognostic and of ultimately treatment uh, uh, changes because they, even though they're both diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, they behave a bit differently and some of the treatments might vary. Now, now we're getting into more DNA and RNA. These are uh, uh, blocks uh, of DNA, uh, of gene expression, and the red is hot. It's like a, uh, a Doppler radar picture, and the green are cool, and you can see that you can pick out genes that are highly expressed in one type and different genes which are highly expressed in the other. So you can actually make this not only by the stains in the pathology, but by sending off the DNA to be analyzed uh, in a lab. And then ultimately you can also uh, think about, oh, these are the genes that are on, maybe these can ultimately be targets for treatment. So we look at it, we, get it, we look at you, we get a biopsy, we send it to the pathologist, they do special studies including uh, the protein and the DNA. Uh, and then occasionally there's some additional testing uh, with cytogenetics. But this is, this is the, uh, a higher power view. This is what diffuse large B cell looks like. And this is a stain for how many cells are dividing. You can see uh, if you just guesstimate, there's like 60 or 70% of the cells stained for this protein called Ki67. That means that's a pretty high number of cells that are in the dividing. You would not see that in a, a slow-growing lymphoma. And this is the MYC MYC gene, and this is a BCL2 gene. Again, we can talk about them in more detail. But these two genes have turned out to have important prognostic information. And when a diffuse large B cell lymphoma expresses both of these, MYC and BCL2, we call it double expressor or dual expressor. Sometimes the cells, are, these genes, these proteins are expressed for other reasons, but sometimes it's expressed because there's a genetic change, a chromosome change, and that can be determined by this thing called fluorescent in situ hybridization. And if they have the DNA change, uh, chromosome change, then it's called a double hit because two different chromosomes are hit. Uh, so some are double hit, but more are double expressors. And again, uh, treatments may vary. It may which study you might be available, uh, eligible for will vary with the exact subtype of large cell lymphoma that you have. This is a follicular lymphoma. The cells, again, are a little bit smaller. There's a few large ones like this one, but most are small. And we grade it. These are grade one and two are considered the slow growing or indolent or low grade lymphomas. When you get almost all large cells, that behaves more like diffuse large B cells. We call that a grade three. But grade one and two follicular lymphoma grow slowly, and we'll talk about the differences clinically between the indolent uh, grade one, two folliculars and then the fast growing diffuse large B cell. Um, again, I, I'm not going to go through this, but you can see all these markers on the surface and protein expression, and you can figure out uh, the pathologist will go through and say, oh, this expresses CD5 uh, and uh, all of these things. Uh, but not CD23, so it's mantle cell lymphoma. CLL is very similar to mantle cell, but it expresses CD23. So uh, you can go through and have a table like this and say, how, this is how the pathologist will help decide, besides what it looks like, all of these stains will help them decide what, uh, what, how to classify your particular lymphoma. And another area that's coming is called next generation sequencing. So when a B cell matures and makes antibody, uh, or is able to make antibody, uh, there's a, a rearrangement, which occurs in normal B cells. It puts three different uh, parts of a B cell gene that are often far apart, puts them together, and your body has many of these and several of these and a few of these, and so every single B cell tends to be a little different. 
And you can actually, in the lab, very quickly sequence these. And if you have a reactive set of B cells, you're going to get a whole bunch of different sequences. But if you have one B cell that started to divide when it shouldn't, and now you have hundreds of that one B cell, you'll start to see this little peak. All of these in the bracket are the exact same. And you can determine that. And that will help you tell that it's a B cell. And also serves as a marker. So if you can define that at diagnosis, and then you get treated, we do what's called minimal residual disease testing. And when you're in remission, we'd like to find very low or zero amounts of that clone. Uh, you should have normal B cells, a mix, but not that clone. And then if your disease does unfortunately grow back, we should be able to detect that. So minimal residual disease testing is looking for have we gotten below a detection limit that's about one in 100,000 cells or even one in a million cells. And I think that's uh, uh, an area that's coming. There's actually, this is a clinical test you can order now uh, in, in, in the clinic. I put this up just to show this staging came from Hodgkin's lymphoma. One is one area, two is m two or more, but all either in the upper half of body, uh, above the diaphragm, which separates the lungs from the abdomen. Three is above and below the diaphragm. Four is outside lymph nodes, such as in the bone marrow or the liver. This is very important in Hodgkin lymphoma. It's not very important in most B cell lymphomas because, as I said, normal B cells circulate. Most lymphomas, if we look hard enough with these molecular studies, uh, are going to be stage three or four. So it doesn't work that well. There are a few stage one uh, large B cell lymphomas, but it's maybe just a few percent. So people are always worried, what stage am I? But remember, this is more of a blood cancer. So almost always it's throughout the body. So don't get freaked out because you have stage three or four disease. That's the common uh, presentation of lymphoma, and we still have excellent treatment. Just going to run through quickly the main types of lymphoma. So diffuse large B cell lymphoma, the most common aggressive ones. Most people get this drug rituximab, which binds to CD20, and a cocktail of chemotherapy called CHOP. Those are the initials of the drugs. So R CHOP. Most people, the majority of people, it goes away and stays away. Uh, if it does come back, the second line therapy traditionally, uh, if you're young and healthy enough to go through it, is uh, additional chemotherapy and autologous stem cells. What's coming in the near future, it's already, if you can't get a transplant, would be CAR T cells, uh, engineered T cells made from your own T cells. Uh, but rapidly we're testing to see if this is actually better than this and perhaps less toxic. And if you can't get any of these or you relapse, there are newer drugs. This is one that recently got approved, polituzumab vidotin. It's an antibody with a drug attached to it, so it sends the drug right into the, the B cells. Uh, and there are some additional drugs uh, recently approved, so a lot of action in this area that previously there was no standard treatment for. Um, I'm going to skip that one just in the interest of time. Follicular lymphoma is the most common indolent. Now, indolent lymphomas you, it often are stage four, often have no symptoms, and uh, so often we do this thing called watch and wait or active observation. Patients always call it watch and worry, uh, at least initially. But if you're feeling fine and you have some small lymph nodes that aren't bothering you, uh, my treatment may shrink them, but they're not going to cure you, so I'm not going to make you feel any better. And there's numbers of studies which suggest that, you know, if we wait and treat you as it starts to grow and about to cause symptoms, that we don't lose anything, and many people go for several years, and some for decades without ever needing treatment. Today, we often use a drug called bendamustine plus rituximab or a similar anti-CD20, uh, but some recent data suggests that an, a pill, lenalidomide, which has been approved for years for multiple myeloma, plus rituximab may be an equivalent uh, uh, approach that may have different toxicities. And sometimes we use rituximab alone, without any chemotherapy. And if you get into remission, the next question is, should you have maintenance? That's a whole hour discussion uh, about the pros and cons of that. But So you can see the difference between a, a multi-drug uh, chemotherapy immediately with diffuse large B cell versus watch and wait and a little antibody with follicular lymphoma. 
the reason for follicular lymphoma, watching and waiting, is I'm not going to make you feel any better if you already feel great. Being off treatment is probably a good thing. And uh, what do you think? It's a patient uh, uh, doctor joint decision, but patient has a big role to play in that. And as treatments are changing, if you can wait three or four or five years, the landscape will change. So another reason not to jump in with treatment uh, immediately is because uh, we may have better options in a few years. Mantle cell lymphoma is not very common, gets a lot of press. It's about, you know, maybe 5%. And this is a complicated schema. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but if you're young and fit, you might get very intensive therapy. If you are behaving indolently, you might get nothing. And most commonly, that since the average age and diagnosis in the late 60s, people don't get uh, intensive treatment to get a uh, less intensive treatment with maintenance. And there's several uh, new drugs that have been approved for this in the, in the last few years. Hodgkin lymphoma, totally different. Uh, average age of diagnosis of, other, of non Hodgkin lymphoma is in you know, 50s and 60s. Average age in Hodgkin's is in the 20s and 30s. Much more common to be in early stage, usually say in the, in the chest and the neck. We cure a very high percentage, especially in the early stage, and the goal there is to treat you with the least treatment possible so that we don't cause problems 10 or 15, 20 years down the line uh, because of chemotherapy or radiation effects. Uh, again, um, complicated decisions that need to be discussed your stage uh, and your other problems, uh, medical problems with your physician. Again, if the disease comes back, we often do high dose chemotherapy with stem cells. <clears throat> Excuse me, but another antibody drug conjugate, Brentuximab vedotin, has been approved for a number of years, uh, very active in the relapse setting, and now is being used in the upfront setting uh, in, with chemotherapy. And immune therapy, which you hear all about on TV, about lung cancer and things hasn't been as effective in non-Hodgkin lymphoma as we would like, but is very active in Hodgkin lymphoma and uh, is rapidly moving into earlier phases of treatment uh, here as well. T-cell lymphoma, less well understood, much less common, very heterogeneous, even though there's only about maybe five or 6,000 cases in the U.S. per year. Um, they're divided in, you know, maybe 20 subtypes. So any one subtype is even rarer. Uh, pathologists uh, often find them difficult to diagnose and classify. Uh, some excitement here, we tend to use the same drugs we use for B cell, uh, except we don't use the, the B cell antibody. But Brentuximab, Vidotin, the anti-CD30 antibody I just mentioned uh, in, a, in a clinical trial, uh, uh, improves your outcome if your cells express CD30. Uh, and so uh, that's been a, an advance recently in uh, T-cell lymphoma. And I put this up again, not so much to read it, but this is from 2013 when the first Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor got approved called ibrutinib till now. So seven years, and all of these drugs are new with new indications and multiple indications just in the last seven years. And new ones are coming at an increasing frequency. It's not like, oh, that's it. Uh, you know, they're, so uh, Bruton's tyrosine kinase is a B-cell signaling drug. I'll show you that in a minute. We have three of those. Ibrutinib is the first one, um, Zanubrutinib the most recently, and Acalabrutinib. Uh, we have anti-CD20 new ones, Obinutuzumab. Uh, we have what's called PI3 kinase, an enzyme important in B-cell growth inhibitors such as Copanlisib. Uh, and idelalicid, and a totally new class of drug called venetoclax. This is a pill. Um, B cells often don't die because they upregulate this protein called BCL2, uh, which prevents cells from dying. Venetoclax interferes with that and teaches cells which think they're immortal that no, they're not immortal, they are supposed to die. And venetoclax has been added with many, many drugs and many, many diseases already. And then a lot of excitement about these, which you can't really name, but I call them Axi cell or TISA cell, and another one called Lisa cell, getting a lot of press. These are CAR T cells, uh, and I will uh, discuss that a little bit more in the next slide, and then we'll probably be done uh, to leave time for questions. 
So if this is your imaginary lymphoma cell, um, these are all the different ways we have to attack it. So the last slide showed, showed you how many different drugs, but this shows you that it's not 10 drugs that do the same thing. Um, so um, the B cell is characterized by an antib making antibodies. And so um, it has an antibody stuck on its surface. It's what, what we call the B cell receptor. And a signal through that antibody inside the cell uh, is what tells a B cell to stay alive and when to grow uh, and when to die. And, uh, and we have now picked apart the signals that go from the cell into the nucleus and B cell signaling agents such as the BTK, Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or PI3 kinase inhibitors interfere with the cell signaling and are incredibly active drugs in a wide variety of B cell and also T cell lymphomas. So this is, these are called small molecule signaling agents. I talked a little bit about things which stick out on the surface, uh, and they are targets for antibodies. So here's, uh, uh, you know, antibodies which bind to a number of cell surface targets. And these antibodies can be just the, by themselves, and then your body recognizes that this portion called the FC portion of the antibody is sticking out, and then your body kills uh, cells which are coated with antibodies. And here's just a list, a small list of the antibodies that target anti-CD20, CD22, and now anti-CD19, um, which is a new target uh, for antibodies. And all of these uh, act by uh, coating the cell and, and having your body recognize it and kill it. Um, we can also have antibodies that have one end that binds to the cell and one end that binds to a T cell. So instead of waiting for your T cell to happen upon the B cell and say, oh, that shouldn't be there, I'm going to kill it, these things called bispecific T cell engagers or bites, you know, attach the B cell and the T cell. So the T cell is right here and it says, oh, I'm supposed to kill that B cell. And these are very effective agents in not directly killing the lymphoma cell, but getting your body's immune system to do it. I talked about lenalidomide. This actually works on the B cell as well as what's called the microenvironment. So cells around the B cell, which are normal, actually help it survive, and lenalidomide interferes with those signaling and uh, gets rid of the support, which the B cell finds uh, it needs to survive. I mentioned venetoclax. And then CAR T cells. So in CAR T cells, we take out uh, some cells from the patient. Uh, we separate out their T cells. Uh, and then we send them off to a lab where they get uh, a gene inserted into them. They get grown up and multiplied. And that gene has on one side something which binds to CD19. And on the other side, it's in the cell telling the T cell to activate. So now the T cell floats around. It attaches to the B cell and says, oh, I'm designed to kill that, and it kills it. And then it doesn't die. It can then co-kill an X cell and an X cell and an X cell. So uh, they're very potent, and they are very active in uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And now there's data in follicular lymphoma and CLL, and a vast uh, uh, basically any B cell lymphoma should be a target for these cells. They do have toxicities as these cells proliferate and kill your B cells, they can cause what's kind of cytokine storm, but we're getting much better at handling that. Uh, and so these are now being done even in the outpatient setting. You get the T cells collected, you go back in a couple of weeks once they're ready, you get it infused, you're watched carefully in the day hospital or you know, come to the clinic every day for the first week or two, but uh, some of these patients never even end up in the hospital. Uh, and then it's a one-time treatment in most people. So this is an exciting area. Uh, with a number of drugs approved and new indications coming. So with that, I'm going to, again, leave time for questions. So remember, lymphoma is a very heterogeneous set of diseases. You know, the fact that you and your uh, work partner have, both have lymphoma, one may have an aggressive, one may have Hodgkin's, one may have follicular, and some one say, well, how come you got chemotherapy right away and I got nothing, but I'm doing fine, you know, so uh, it's nice. Uh, to talk about pe to other people with lymphoma, but you know the LRF tries to pair you with someone with a similar disease and stage so that you, you understand what, what you're going to look for.
many, many effective treatments, as I've tried to highlight, new ones coming uh, several per year. And when you think about the treatments, you know, most of the treatments that we use are combination. So now if I've got 10 different classes of treatment, the number of effective combinations goes up exponentially. And the number of combinations that we have to test uh, are exciting. It's also daunting because how do we choose which ones to, to, diagn uh, to use? And that's why it's critical uh, that we get as many people on clinical trials as we can because the only way we're going to learn which combinations are best are to try them out and, and, uh, and learn from, from patients who are uh, kind enough and willing enough to, to uh, uh, participate in such trials. I didn't spend a lot of time, but you know, I, I mentioned that follicular lymphoma is slow growing and we don't treat it because we can't cure it. So, you know, we don't want to make you very sick to get a little better response if we know it's going to come back anyway. Whereas in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, our goal is to get rid of it once and for all. We'd like you to get, you know, six cycles of uh, chemotherapy and be done and go about your life. And so in that case, we'll be a little more intensive in terms of the treatment and keeping on schedule than we will if we're just trying to keep you out of trouble. We always try to balance the risks of new treatments versus the benefits. And choose wisely is, is for you as a patient uh, and to discuss with your doctor, uh, hopefully an expert in lymphoma, not only what your treatment is this time, but does this close any doors? Um, if I expect this to be in remission for a number of years, what can I expect as my next treatment? Uh, if I get a bone marrow transplant, does that mean I'm not eligible for new treatments that are coming? All of these things, you know, we try to predict the future. I don't know what's going to be here five years from now. I have some ideas, but I may be totally wrong. Uh, but we don't want to use up treatments, uh, you know, one after the other uh, just to make ourselves feel like, okay, we put it in remission if it's not going to cure you, and then find out that, oh, we sort of uh, used up our treatments and, and we uh, don't, uh, and you're not eligible for new treatments coming. So again, depends on the disease. We don't want to withhold treatment in a curative setting. We might uh, do less when we're just trying to keep it under control. So all of these things are complicated discussions that you need to have with your physician who knows your situation, your age, your other health problems, your type of lymphoma, what treatment, if any, you've had before, et cetera. So uh, it, it is not a, a one-size-fits-all uh, decision uh, for lymphoma treatment. And the good news is we have many, many more options, uh, but it does make it more complicated. Uh, and patients, you know, I know they find it difficult when we say, well, we're asking you, and they say, well, you're the doctor, you're supposed to tell me. And we go back and forth. We don't want to be too prescriptive. Uh, but ultimately, we, you know, it is, I think, the, the physician's job to give you the best advice and say, these are the options, but I think for you this would be best. Uh, not that you shouldn't take one of the others if you have a different idea. So. Uh, and with that, um, a quick tour uh, through lymphoma from uh, onset to diagnosis and a little bit about treatment, and I'm happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, we'll now begin our Q&A portion of the program. Just as a reminder, please keep your questions as general as possible so that the entire audience can benefit from their answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit your question through the Q&A box on your screen. We'll take as many questions as possible, but if you have a question that does not get answered, you can always reach out to the LRS helpline at 800-500-9976. And our first question from online for you, Dr. Smith, is, is biopsy of axillary lymph nodes possible? Absolutely. It's a common place to biopsy. Um, people worry about it because if you have breast cancer and you do an axillary lymph node dissection, you're at risk because the lymphatic drainage from the arm uh, might be compromised getting lymphedema. But uh, if you just need a biopsy of a lymph node in the axilla, taking one out or a core needle biopsy uh, is very feasible uh, and should not be a problem. Great, thank you. Um, our second question is, how long on average does it take to diagnose a lymphoma following a biopsy? So, yeah, that's a good question. It, it depends. If you're in a, um, an academic center where the pathologist might look at it very quickly, uh, might be as short as 48 hours. Uh, if it gets sent out to a lab, say if you're from a surgery center, it might take a week. Uh, the special stains take another day or two, but 
you should it should not take longer than a week. Um, you may not have all the DNA testing and some of the chromosomes, but you should know that uh, I have a pretty good idea within a week uh, of a biopsy. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, does presence of any particular genetic abnormality influence your treatment selection for MCL patients? Okay, so yeah, so here's someone who, who knows all the, the uh, details of their type of lymphoma probably. So mantle cell lymphoma is a subtype, uh, as I mentioned. It's characterized by a genetic change which causes overexpression of a gene called cyclin D1. So that's sort of makes the diagnosis. Um, probably the one thing we look at in mantle cell is the proliferation rate. So I showed you the KI67. If it's very high, then we'll be more uh, likely to be aggressive with our treatment. Uh, what's new is uh, a, there's a gene called P53, uh, which is a tumor, uh, an oncogene, or it's actually a tumor suppressor gene, so loss of it promotes to tumors. Uh, in, in all sorts of tumors. In CLL, it's very important prognostic indicator. We're learning that in a percentage, maybe 10% or so of mantle cell lymphoma, uh, it is also mutated. And uh, in those patients, intensive chemotherapy does not really work as well as we would like. So that is one place where we will uh, often start with one of the targeted agents like a BTK inhibitor rather than chemotherapy. But that, that's a work in progress. But I, I would say that's the one genetic abnormality in mantle cell that might change your treatment. OK. Um, and our next question is, what types of lymphoma are lumbar punctures a routine test for? So we, we do that in some of the aggressives. So if you have an indolent lymphoma, we would almost never do it. Uh, if you have an aggressive lymphoma, like DLBCL, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, the ones that have that MYC translocation, that MYC gene, or the double hits, those have a propensity to go to the brain. So we would almost always do a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture uh, looking at the spinal fluid. And actually, in those cases, we'll actually put chemotherapy into that. We'll take some fluid out to analyze. We'll put some pre preventative chemotherapy into the spinal fluid, which sounds barbaric, but it really isn't, uh, uh, to try to reduce the risk that it will spread to there. Uh, for garden variety, the common diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, if it's in certain places, like very close to the spine, in the nasal sinuses uh, that have a tendency to spread, there's a few others, the adrenal gland, some odd extranodal when it's outside lymph nodes. So, uh, I would say the main things are if you have the MYC gene, not just expressed, but, but the genetic change, a certain locations, uh, and then the, the very high KS67, very aggressive, like a Burkitt lymphoma, which I didn't talk about. But a small subset would get the uh, spinal tap and the prophylactic, what's called intrathecal or into, into the spinal fluid chemotherapy. Great, thank you. Um... Our next question is, uh, I was diagnosed in 2018 with splenic marginal zone lymphoma, and I'm about to finish treatment on rituximab. What happens next usually for these cases, and what's the outlook after rituximab? Yeah, so splenic marginal zone I didn't talk about. So marginal zone lymphoma is also about 5 or 6% of lymphomas, and it's broken down into what's called extranodal, which occurs commonly, most commonly in the stomach and is associated with its infection, H. pylori, which also causes ulcers. And that's interesting because in the stomach, if you treat the H. pylori, the lymphoma actually shrinks in the majority of cases, and that's the only treatment you need. So that's the extranodal marginal zone. Uh, sometimes occurs in lymph nodes, but a common place is the spleen. We call it splenic lymphoma, splenic marginal zone, usually a big spleen. If you look hard, there's often almost always cells in the blood or the bone marrow at a low level. So we used to take the spleen out, and it gave us long remissions, but now we have better treatments. And rituximab works quite well, and it's a very simple treatment. And uh, many people with splenic marginal zone lymphoma who get rituximab stay in remission for years and years. Uh, and even if after a number of years it comes back, you can get rituximab again and go back into remission. So basically, you know, we want to see, does the spleen shrink? Um, it may not go back entirely to normal. Uh, that's okay. Uh, and then we usually just watch it. Um, and then if it starts to grow and or cause trouble, then you could get rituximab again. Uh, we do have lots of other treatments. Bendamustine works very well, some of the targeted agents. 
But I would say uh, your your future with marginal zone of the spleen is rituximab, wait, probably get a couple years, if not much longer out of it, uh, and then get rituximab again and keep doing that until it stops working, and by then we'll have some other magic treatments. Ibrutinib, the BTK inhibitors work very well in this disease. So your survival, I would say, is probably not likely to be very much compromised because of the drugs we have on hand and the likelihood that, you know, in 10, 15 years we'll have even better. So, um, you know, I think this is a very favorable one to have. Great. Thanks for that response. Um, our next question is, uh, why is there a cure for Hodgkin lymphoma but not for non-Hodgkin lymphoma? Well, I'll, I'll clarify that in a second, but if I knew that, I'd probably get my Nobel Prize. Um, <laughs> So you, know, uh, so, you know, so you know, Hodgkin's is sort of a, you know, we call it lymphoma, but it's a totally different disease. Younger patients, different distribution, different biology. Um, but that being said, we do cure many diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. The cure rate for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma now with rituximab chop, uh, even in the, war, you know, we, we break it down into prognostic groups based on age and other, other factors. But, you know, there are some people who have a 90% cure rate uh, which is similar to Hodgkin's. Even the worst case, it's probably 60, 65%. So I, I think diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is definitely treated with the idea for cure, and, and the majority of people do get cured. It's the slow-growing ones that, conversely, they grow slowly, they don't bother you, but we can't get rid of. And so a simple thought is just if it's growing faster, it responds better to chemotherapy. If it's growing slower, it tends to be, you know, not as sensitive. We may be curing the indolence, we just don't know, with some of our new treatments. We clearly think that CAR T cells may cure some, but again, you know, if I can get you in remission for five years with simple chemotherapy, I don't know if you're cured with a CAR T cell until, you know, maybe 10, 15 years from now, and they've only been around for two or three. So we may be curing indolent lymphoma, but we won't know it for another 10 years. Um, but it is important to know that diffuse large B cell and some of the aggressive, uh, even T cells, the numbers aren't as good. But you know there are cures in peripheral T cell and many cures in diffuse large B cell. So great, thanks for clarifying that. Um, our next question is: In what circumstances would an MRI be used? So MRI tends to be used for a focal area because it's hard. You you can do a whole body MRI, but takes a couple hours, and most people don't like to lie flat in that machine for that long. So uh, we tend to use an MRI, for instance, uh, in a, when we're looking at one, a really good uh, view of a small area. And the other thing that's very helpful when in bone, because CAT scans uh, and PET scans don't give us a good idea of bone. So for instance, if you had a mass that was close to your spine, we would want an MRI, because we can look at that one area and it involves the bone, we can find out, is it invading the bone, is it next to the bone, et cetera. So uh, MRIs are often used for, for that. Um, they can be used anywhere, but uh, as I say, technically, uh, we just get, we can get a PET scan or a CAT scan, look at the whole body, and you really just can't do that with the MRI. So focal areas where you really want a very detailed, close picture. Uh, the brain is a, is a common one. Uh, MRI inside the brain, because the bone kind of scatters the CAT scan image, so MRI gives you a much better view in the brain and the spine. Uh, so anywhere we're looking inside or near bone uh, would be that area. Thanks. Yeah. And um, our next question comes from someone who says they've recently been diagnosed with an AFX skin cancer, and they ask if CLL patients are at higher risk of skin cancer, and if so, why that might be. Yes, uh, they are. So patients with CLL are, are at increased risk, and, and actually all lymphoma patients are at somewhat increased risk of second cancers, but CLL uh, is one that we notice it uh, largely, uh, I think because tradition, people with CLL have often lived for you know, quite a long time. Many people never need treatment, and so uh, you know, they, they get old enough to get other cancers, as we all do as we get older. Uh, but definitely anything where your immune system is not 100%, and that includes virtually any lymphoma, and then especially if you've gotten chemotherapy, which further affects your immune system, you're going to be prone to uh, certain cancers. And skin cancers seem to be quite sensitive to immunosuppression. So people who've had a bone marrow transplant, uh, allogeneic bone marrow transplant, have a higher incidence of uh, 
skin cancers, people on immunosuppression for, say, rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease, higher incidence of skin cancers. So skin cancers are very pro, uh, re require your body's immune surveillance to keep them under control. Think about all the, the damage you get from the sun day in, day out. It's amazing we don't get more skin cancer. So your body is constantly getting rid of damaged cells. And when you have an immune system that can't uh, keep up with that, uh, it's more likely to get them. So anyone with CLL or low-grade lymphoma, especially if they had chemotherapy, uh, we generally should, should generally be getting an annual you know, full-body skin exam and get uh, early skin cancers removed. Thank you. Um, our next question is, under what circumstances are extra genetic testing done to diagnose? So sometimes we're, you know, mainly we're looking for those uh, genetic changes that we're going to do something about. So uh, we might look for P53 in mantle cell or CLL a mutation. We might look for MYC or other oncogenes that uh, we, we don't see, uh, you know, on a, on a uh, the usual test, but we are concerned that's there. Molecular testing is much more sensitive. And as we get new targeted agents that, that hit certain uh, pathways and we get more options, we're going to want to expand that, as we've done in, in like lung cancer and colon cancer, to determine what the best treatment would be. So right now, our cure rates, are, our treatments are very effective, but if you're third or fourth line and your disease isn't behaving uh, you know, as well as we would like, uh, we'll often send the, the DNA sequencing at that point to look for uh, a suggestion of what our next drug should be. Uh, you know, we've used up our standard ones. Let's look at, you know, do you have a pathway activated uh, that might be a candidate for PI3 kinase or a BTK or something like that. So I think that's where we're, we're going to see the genetic testing primarily. Uh, later on, we may see it just everyone as the cost comes down. But right now in lymphoma, we have pretty good treatment, so it's really reserved for those uh, more complex cases that aren't behaving the way w that we would expect. Great. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, so the second to last one is, is there any pattern to the diagnosis of double hit lymphomas? Are there certain more common types you see together? Well, so the double hits are, are really the MYC and BCL2 or a gene called BCL6. So if you have all three, it's called triple hit. In my mind, then the MYC and BCL2 is the key one. Uh, and, and they tend to be rapidly growing um, and uh, a little bit younger patients. Um, and, and so those are sort of hints. If we see that KI67 over 90%, uh, we'll ask the pathologist, even if they didn't look at it the first time, to go back and look for that double hit uh, because it makes us concerned. So they, they tend to be very fast growing, uh, and uh, uh, the, the converse is that we're getting better at treating them. Uh, because I mentioned the BCL2 and the drug venetoclax or venclexta, which uh, inhibits BCL2, there are a lot of very exciting trials adding that up front that maybe we can overcome that bad prognosis. Uh, in the double hit. So a lot of activity in that area there, fortunately not that common. Uh, the dual expressors where they express MYC and BCL2 are more common, but don't, you know, they're, they're not quite as bad uh, or they don't require different treatment the way the double hits do. Great. And um, our last question for today is, is MRD available for in remission DLBCL patients instead of via a CT monitor? Yeah, that is a very important question. So the answer is yes, it's available. Uh, there are several trials which look at it. Um, what's interesting, if you have DLBCL, a garden variety one, not the double hits, and you have a PET scan that's negative at the end of treatment, your chance of it coming back is fairly small, depending on your initial staging and things, maybe 10, 20 percent. And most people are identified because they come in and say, I, I feel like it's back. So we've gotten away from a lot of routine staging CAT scans because of the expense, the radiation exposure, and that we, they're not usually very helpful. So this would be a great place to monitor every couple months the MRD testing, and that's what people are looking at. Uh, so I think that's an area. It's not ready for prime time, but uh, there, there's, there's a lot of studies going on, and I think it will, uh, it will be there. Remember also that almost all the recurrences in diffuse large B cell occur in the first two years, maybe three. So you don't have to be monitored for the rest of your life. You'd be monitored for two years, and if you're in remission, that's pretty clear that you know you, you have a very low chance—not zero, but 
very low chance of it coming back. So uh, I think you're exactly right. MRD testing, we hope, will replace or, or add to just simple blood work rather than uh, imaging for following diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, and, and, and probably other diseases, like if you give CAR-T for uh, CLL or follicular lymphoma and we're hoping for a cure, we might just follow uh, MRD in that setting as well. So I think that's an up-and-coming test. It's, it's just easy, a uh, turnaround times a, a week, and uh, uh, you're going to see more of that used. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today about this important topic. It was a great presentation. Thanks. My pleasure. I hope uh, it's helpful. And remember, it's uh, Lymphoma Awareness Day, so light everything red. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, thank, you. thank you again also to our attendees for joining us on today's call, and we hope you found the information both informative and also hopeful. We'd also like to thank our sponsor for making this program possible, Foundation Medicine and Genentech. Please remember if you have any additional questions or you'd like to be connected with someone else who has been impacted by lymphoma, you can reach out to the LRF helpline. Also, at the conclusion of this program, you will receive an email prompting you to complete a program evaluation. I'd ask you please take a few moments to complete this brief evaluation as these are important for helping LRF to ensure they deliver the most useful and meaningful programming to you. And with that, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us and have a wonderful day.